What is it like to come face to face with evil? To confront your worst nightmare? When a killer comes calling, there's often no escape. A man who can kill is evil beyond belief. To truly encounter evil is a rarity most will never experience. I believe in evil, uh, and I have experienced people that are evil. But for those unfortunate few who do and survive to tell the tale, the mental scars often never heal. I couldn't breathe, I was, my eyes felt bulging. All I could see was his face on my face, and he was just staring into my eyes. We meet the men and women whose lives have been forever altered by their brush with the beasts who live among us. This is Encounters with Evil. In tonight's programme, the psychopaths who walk among us, unknown and unknowable. Men and women incapable of empathy who prey on the innocent and the abandoned. A psychopath is somebody who is wired differently in their brain to other people. Psychopath is, is somebody who has very little guilt who actually mimics emotions. Not all psychopaths are violent, not all psychopaths are murderous, but there are a very small minority who have a predilection for serious offences. Coming up, Scottish serial murderer and rapist Peter Tobin, who hid behind numerous false identities to conduct a 15-year reign of terror. An hour and a half of my life, he, uh, he left me on his own, so I literally grabbed my son and went to the coach station. One of Britain's most notorious sociopaths, Moore's murderer, Ian Brady. Incarcerated for over 50 years for his terrible crimes against children. She said, let me go home and see my mum. I'll not, I'll not tell them you've hurt me and harmed me, just let me go home and see my mum. But first, a horrific portrait of a psychopath, Joanna Dennehy, one of the UK's most frightening female killers. She clearly enjoyed killing and enjoyed doing it again and again. Being bad gave her a reason to exist and being mad gave her an explosive power that she could hold over other people. In 2013, mother of two Joanna Dennehy went on a 10-day killing spree. Murdering three men, and making attempts on the lives of two others. The bodies of those she killed were found dumped in ditches near Peterborough. Dennehy is the rarest of multiple murderers, a female killer with a willing male accomplice to help her in her murderous rampage. This is the only case that I'm aware of where you've got the female taking a very clear-cut, dominant, more active role. We have very few serial killers in this country. Female serial killers are very, very small, even within that small population. Myra Hindley, Rosemary West, Joanne Derny. And then you stop because you can't think of anybody else. Dennehy is considered so dangerous by the British penal system that she is only the third woman in history to be given a whole life jail term for her evil crimes. She was on a spree. She's not technically a serial killer. She committed her murders within a very short space of time, and there was no cooling off period between her victims. It's almost as if she was on. She was on show. Dennehy is somebody who takes what people think that they know about people who are dangerous and how they operate, and actually turns it all upside down. But what could have turned this young woman into a multiple murderer? Was she born with the capacity for evil, or was there something deeply wrong in her psyche? 
I do believe that psychopaths are born and we've got good evidence of that. But being a psychopath doesn't make you a serial killer. I would argue that people aren't born serial killers. They become serial killers due to things that happen in their lives. Somewhere along the line, she's developed a very powerful fantasy that is sexually gratifying to her, but it's also emotionally fulfilling. And the fantasy involves seducing a man and then humiliating him and ultimately obliterating him, destroying him. There was certainly no indication from her earliest years that Dennehy would take such a dark path. Usually we find that somebody's trying to resolve something in their own mind. They're trying to re recreate a scenario from childhood that has a different outcome and ending. Born in August 1982 in St Albans, Hertfordshire, by all accounts, she grew up in a loving family and a stable home. Her father was a security guard and her mother a shop manager. Both doted on her and her younger sister and her childhood was, was perfectly normal and acceptable. The parents did everything they possibly could to bring both girls up in, in a normal way. Joanna was very sporty at school. She was a very clever, articulate young girl up until the age of about 13 or 14 when she started to go off the rails. Dennehy claimed she was abused as a child, but there is no evidence to support this. Something went wrong as a teenager. As a teenager, she got involved in drugs, she got involved in drink, and she developed a liking for older boys. What we're looking at with Dennehy is lots of ingredients coming together at the wrong time to result in the end product. And then she meets a young man called John Trainer. Her relationship developed over about 10 years, but also her homicidal bloodlust developed over 10 years until she killed in 2013. We start to see episodes of where she becomes what we call a, a low impulse control individual, where the slightest thing will result in her overdramatic response to something. Her partner, John Trainer, experienced firsthand Dennehy's descent into psychopathy and eventually separated from her for good, taking their two children with him because of her increasingly violent behavior. She'd slashed all her arm, blood was pouring, she had blood coming from there, and short mini skirt, she'd cut her legs, and both my kids are in bed, and she's pulled out this big, massive knife, and that was it, that was the end for me, that was it. It's a very disturbed relationship. There's a lot of violence in it, a lot of separation. She leaves him, comes back. During their early years together, before the children were born, Dennehy developed a taste for extreme S&M, and she was happy to explore her erotic obsession with both men and women. Many she would bring home for violent sex. I would expect her to be into S&M without any doubt. What she wanted, and this is what often psychopaths are looking for, is excitement. They have a very, very short attention span. They want to be moving on, they want to be changing, they don't want to be tied down. Dennehy was diagnosed with paraphilia sadomasochism. So what that means is she got sexual thrills through the infliction of pain, suffering and humiliation on other people. Trainer had to live with her twisted impulses on a daily basis. She could see that John Trainer was somebody that she could wipe her feet on like a doormat. If she wanted to bring a woman home for sex in front of John Trainer, she'd do it. If she wanted men in the house to have joint group sex with, she'd have it on the lawn with John Trainer looking out the kitchen window. For five years solid, really. I, I mean, where I was living, five years solid was torture. It was, it was just every single day, it was something else. And it, it was progressing from drinking was making her cut herself. We moved to Luton, we got, we got um, a shared room basically and she put a grown man to tears just with a, a, a mouth verbally. She, she stuck it and that's when you sort of knew. After abandoning her family for a year and a half, Dennehy returns, but this time wielding a knife. I think that was just the break, that was the end, that was it because I had two kids in bed that night and she's come around and she was steaming drunk. And when that knife came out, all I could think was the kids were in the bedroom and, and she's, I know she's violent and she's aggressive.
After the couple split, Danahy moves to Peterborough and rents a bedsit. It's here her fixation with violence and her homicidal tendencies begin to express themselves fully. Joanne Dennehy was somebody who actually reveled in her status as she would have seen it as a killer. She was somebody who wanted to be seen as imposing, threatening. She was known to her neighbours as man-woman, not because of just a, a lack of femininity, but because of this male bravado that she had about her, this very deliberate aggression. Joanne Dennehy's homicidal tendencies fully emerged after she met a, a man, um, a very tall man called Gary Stretch. At seven foot three inches, Gary Stretch dwarfs Dennehy, yet he falls under her psychopathic spell completely. And then the killing spree starts. Joanne Dennehy's first Peterborough murder was a Polish lad called Lukas. She met him in a, um, a big shopping mall in Peterborough. Joanna uh, invited him to a property belonging to Kevin Lee, the landlord. Uh, she opened the door to him, and within seconds, she plunged a five-inch lock knife into him. One stab went through the heart, and he died after a very, very short struggle in the front room. Days later, she stabs 56-year-old John Chapman to death while he sleeps in his flat upstairs. Her reason? He'd apparently seen her take a bath. Two of Joanna Dennehy's victims were murdered inside this house on the outskirts of Peterborough. The first, Lukas Slabazewski, a man she had befriended, was lured here with a series of text messages. He, like the other victims, was stabbed in the heart. His body was placed in a wheelie bin, Dennehy casually showing it to a teenage girl. Ironically, for all of Joanne Dennehy's bravado and maleness, if you like, she needed Gary Stretch, she needed the help of a man because, of course, she wasn't physically able to lift and dispose of bodies without some help. With two murders notched on her belt, Dennehy was high on the killing and stoned on super strong marijuana almost around the clock. The pleasure seeking, that's what a lot of psychopaths like, is the pleasure and the killing and she clearly enjoyed the killing. And she made a joke about uh, Britney Spears' song, uh, whoops, I've done it again. She's, she, she's got the characteristics that we would associate with a psychopath. But Dennehy's murderous journey wasn't over. She'd started an affair with her landlord, Kevin Lee, when she'd rented her bedsit, and he was becoming alarmed by her disturbed behavior. She was having an affair with, with Lee, and he, a couple of days before she killed him, he told his wife about the affair. So he's gone home, told his wife he's having an affair with her, and then two or three days later, she kills him. Dennehy was worried he may alert the police if he learned of the deaths on his property. For her, there was an obvious solution. She invites Kevin Lee to come round to the house where the Polish guy was murdered. And she says to him, I want you to dress up in a black sequined dress and we'll have sex. He went round to the house where Joan was waiting for him. He slipped into something more comfortable, which is the black sequined dress. And after he put it on, she attacked him with a dagger. He was the only man to suffer any defensive wounds on his hands or his arms. He put up a desperate struggle for his life. She and her accomplice, Gary Stretch, dump Kevin Lee's corpse in a ditch, still wearing the black sequined gown. There, they performed one final act of degradation. He was found there a good few days later, um, wearing the black sequined dress. It was pulled up to expose his buttocks, and they'd inserted a metal bathroom object into his rectum. This is a woman who has a need to murder, but not just murder, humiliate men. And she doesn't go about it in the way that you would expect of a serial killer. She makes no secret of it. This is somebody who bragged about her behavior. The couple then decide to go on the run. 
There are some suggestions that she very much saw herself and Stretch as being a latter-day Bonnie and Clyde, and she was very keen on the idea of amassing nine murder victims before having some glorious showdown with law enforcement in which her and Stretch would be killed. Thankfully, she never got to that body count. Again, it's this search for fame, this search for uh, being different. Passion that she had was to try and become a famous killer. Dennehy and Stretch drive to his hometown of Hereford. By now, the bloodlust within her had risen. Consumed by evil, Dennehy is determined to kill again. Joe and Dennehy and Gary Stretch are driving around Hereford and they come across a gentleman walking his dog. And Dennehy says, stop, Gaz, I want to kill that man. And she stabs him 40 times. The person who saw her nearby said she was licking the blood off of the blade. And then she says, I want to kill somebody else. 10 minutes later, she attacks 57-year-old Robin Bereza, a retired fireman out for a run. He manages to fight off her frenzied knife attack and Dennehy flees the scene. When she stabbed her final two victims who survived, she was talking to them as she did it. She was telling them what she was doing, almost as if she was providing a director's DVD commentary to her offending. Following the second frenzied attack, every available police officer in the county is tasked to hunt down Dennehy. Within hours, they've cornered her and she's arrested. Once you're arrested and you clearly know that the police have all the cards in their hands and the evidence is there, then most killers will, will concede the point. And, and certainly serial killers will concede the point because there's no, there's no point in arguing when you know the evidence is against you. Stretch is caught soon after. Having left a legacy of death and shattered lives, Dennehy is sentenced to life in prison without the prospect of release. She is dangerous and will be for a long period of time. Evil, no. Dangerous, yes. Many serial killers and multiple murderers evolve in their offending, escalating from attacks and assault, often to sexual crimes and ultimately to murder. This developmental pattern is one forensic psychologists and criminologists are familiar with. Some serial murderers and serial sexual offenders do evolve and they graduate from petty crimes such as voyeurism or stealing items through to more serious personal assaults and ultimately on to stalking behaviours and then murder. But are such people born this way? with a desire to act out evil impulses, psychopaths destined to become killers? Or do they have a choice in the matter? People in general are very reluctant to the idea of accepting that anyone could be born evil, could be born bad. But in the case of science, we know that people are born with certain proclivities, certain predispositions, which say that they are quite probably going to harm others and possibly kill them. So this is all gray matter. So this is just picking out those areas that are statistically particularly reduced in the psychopathic group. There's always going to be an interaction between their genetics and their childhood environment. And certainly in our own study, the psychopathic men reported a greater degree of childhood maltreatment than the non-psychopathic antisocial men. Usually, psychopaths will have that biological predisposition, but then they've experienced suffering. And somewhere along the line, they've felt isolated and disconnected from their fellow human beings. And then they want to be in the position of making other people suffer. In recent years, with the development of MRI scanning, scientists have identified some key areas in our brains that seem to indicate there is a biological basis for such aberrant behaviour. I do believe that psychopaths are born, and we've got good evidence of that, that in actual fact we can, we can measure somebody's testosterone levels at birth, and that will tell us how empathic they're going to be later on in life. They all 
had the same underlying pattern, which is damage or loss of function to the orbital cortex right above the eyes and to the front of the temporal lobe, this whole limbic or emotional cortex. And all of those that I've looked at, uh, they turn out to be psychopaths. And, you know, in this case, they were, they were murderers too, some rapists, but psychopathic, really bad criminals. Peter Tobin is one of the United Kingdom's most notorious serial killers. From 1991 to 2006, he roamed across Britain under various assumed identities on an evil journey of rape and murder, targeting young women to satisfy his carnal desires. Peter Tobin is someone who is very clearly psychopathic. Um, from his, his earliest childhood right through his life, um, he was someone who was indifferent to the feelings of others. He would treat them as objects. They were just toys for his, him to play with. He was actually very careful and meticulous about the way he did it. He's a serial killer that has been convicted of killing three people, but we don't know how many other people he has killed. His face always haunts me. It's got a rather strange, thin, kind of creepy face. It's always sent a slight shiver down my spine. During a 15-year killing career, Tobin abused, raped and murdered three women. But these victims were only the ones that police could prove in court. There are a number of unsolved murders and unsolved serious sexual assaults that some people have tried to tie Tobin to, either because he was geographically present at the time of those crimes or because those crimes specifically have the same MO as those crimes for which he's been convicted of. So far, Tobin has refused to admit any connection with other killings that UK police are interested in. His uh, refusal to confess to anything, I think even the crimes that he has committed and, and, been, and been convicted of, is a sign of, of his psychopathy. The youngest girl of the two. Tobin first really came into focus for police in 1993, when he was the prime suspect in a sexual assault and rape case of two 14-year-old girls in the Portsmouth area. We are very anxious to trace the occupier of this flat in order to find out exactly what happened. We know the occupier to be a Peter Tobin. After the horrendous rape and near killing of the two 14-year-old girls, um, Tobin went on the run and hid out in, in a, a religious institution called the Jesus Fellowship. He changed his name to Peter Wilson. The queues for the public gallery had begun before dawn. Tobin was caught after members of the Jesus Fellowship alerted police following a television appeal. On the 18th of May, 1994, at Winchester Crown Court, Tobin enters a plea of guilty and receives a 14-year prison sentence. 10 years later, now 58, Tobin is released on licence and moves to Paisley in Scotland. Here, he's required to keep in regular contact with his probation team, as he's on the sex offenders register. He lived, I think, quite quite quietly in the community. I mean, he made, he made a number of friends and acquaintances. He, he found a home at the church. He assumed the name Pat McLaughlin. And I think he found uh, a bed and board at the church because he presented himself as someone in need. After two years of being under the radar, Tobin comes to the attention of the police again. Angelica Kluke was in Scotland to um, work on her English, but she didn't have a, a lot of money. Um, but she was also doing odd jobs around the, the, the church. And apparently she was always particularly helpful to Tobin. And I think in her head, they'd become friends. Um, perhaps in Tobin's head, they were also friends. Um, and, and something s snapped in him, or perhaps he was always actually grooming her, winning her friendship and her trust so that he could attack her and make her his next victim. Following the post-mortem examination this afternoon, 
Angelica's death has now been treated as murder. All I can say it was a, it was a horrific and very, very violent uh, attack on a young, uh, young lady. Tobin conceals her body, most likely still alive, beneath the floor in the crypt. Eventually, uh, after three or three days, Angelica's body was found concealed under the floorboards of the church, just under the confessional. Um, she had been, uh, as was described by the judge, dropped in there like a pile of rubbish. She had been raped. She had been stabbed repeatedly in the top of her body, hit over the head and killed. And she was put under there by Tobin. There's a clear indication from the injuries that Angelica suffered and the number of stab wounds that went way beyond the number required to kill her, that he must go into a kind of murderous frenzy. He also had her tied up and gagged. You're, you're not thinking that this is something that's just spur of the moment, he's become aroused, perhaps been rejected. You think that there's quite a lot of preparation there. He had the, the means to tie her up, gag her, and he had a plan to conceal her body. So he knew he was going to kill her. With the murder discovered, Tobin once again goes on the run, this time to London, where he checks into hospital under the alias James Kelly. But the publicity around the ghoulish church murder means he's swiftly identified. Strathclyde police cuff and charge the killer. Peter Tobin, a convicted sex offender and now a convicted murderer. His anger overflowed as he was led from court this evening. The grisly manner of Angelica Cloak's violent death led police to conclude she may have been just one of many to die at Tobin's hands. Tobin, in my mind, must have committed other crimes. The ferocity of the assault on Angelica and the way that he concealed her. And the following day, you know, he had actually rebuilt and painted a shed where part of the attack had taken place. He'd moved it with someone else and he'd repainted that. So he'd gone to lengths. And in my mind, I thought, and I, when I saw the body and the, the state she was in, I thought, we may be dealing with a serial killer here. I think the type of person who can conceal and then move a body is a psychopath, a serial killer. It's someone who's going to do it again and again. It's their pastime. And it was quite clear, I think, to investigators, it was clear to, to me as a journalist when I read about it, that, that that was not this guy's first murder. That was not the actions of a guy who's killed for the first time. With Tobin behind bars, an investigation into his past is fast-tracked. Operation Anagram was quite properly and logically uh, set up after Angelica Kluke's murder because here we had a 60-year-old man who had committed the type of murder that very, very few people, even, even other people who've killed, would have been capable of carrying out. A team of detectives set about exploring previous places Tobin had lived in the UK in the hope of matching up his timeline with other murder inquiries or missing persons cases. It's not long before they get a result. We found out that he lived in a place called Bathgate in Scotland. And the year that he lived in Bathgate in Scotland was the same year that a young a woman called Vicky Hamilton had gone missing. Vicky was last spotted waiting here for a bus to Falkirk. She'd never made the journey from her sister's house through Bathgate before and was anxious to get home. When the bus arrived, she wasn't there to get on. She was here, just a mile away at the home of Peter Tobin in Robertson Avenue. He'd abducted the 15-year-old, drugged her with sedatives, sexually assaulted her and killed her, using a knife to chop up her body. A month after Vicky disappeared, Tobin moved from here to the other end of Britain. Quite early on in this process, they had two really solid strikes. And when um, Tobin's flat was searched, uh, Tobin's former flat in Bathgate was searched, and a knife was found 
in the attic with human tissue on it, which matched Vicky Hamilton's DNA. Obviously, they had hit absolute gold dust in terms of the investigation. DNA forensics proved Tobin had killed Vicky, but police still had a problem as her body was missing and Tobin refused to help. It was in Bathgate, West Lothian, that Tobin had lived with his third wife, Kathy, who had a son with him at just 16. After his capture, she shared her insight into the twisted mind of her former husband on daytime television. I completely um, fit the victim, his victim's profile. I was 16, naive, vulnerable, and obviously also felt I knew everything because I was 16. Yeah. And, um, and that's uh, similar to the other girls that have been in his life. I think having Daniel changed um, from me being a victim to perhaps be, becoming a possession with him. Cathy was a young woman with a son to look after. She didn't know that her husband was probably already a murderer. He was continuously um, increasing his levels of abuse towards me. Um, and after we got married, we went to Scotland straight away. And at that point, I was now 600, 700 miles away from friends and family and totally under his control. Vulnerable and alone, teenage Cathy is forced to endure his perverse sexual demands. Tobin then started bringing prostitutes back to their flat and uh, Cathy was forced to, to watch what went on. So that was part of his, the kick that, that, that he got. It was, it was all about control. I think that was one of the key things that gave Cathy the, the strength and the absolute determination to get herself and her son away from him. For one moment, uh, for an hour and a half of my life, he, uh, he left me on his own and left the doors unlocked. So I literally grabbed my son and went to the coach station. Waiting at the coach station to get on the coach to Portsmouth was the worst hour and a half of my life because I thought if he comes back to the house and sees I'm not there, there's only going to be one place I could have afforded to yeah. escape to. And I, I was absolutely convinced he'd find us at the coach station. Cathy escaped the dreadful relationship, unaware of his murderous activities at the time. It was Operation Anagram's investigation into Tobin's evil past that revealed the full extent of his crimes. Police came to his old home in Margate because they'd had a cold case review of the disappearance of Dinah McNichol, and information led them to this address. We actually looked at Tobin's life and where he had been, and we found out that Tobin had been in the, he lived in Irvine Drive in Margate, Kent, and there was a missing female that looked like a Tobin, and I used this, you know, it was someone that had been hitchhiking, someone that was still missing, nobody had been recovered, called Dinah McNichol. And we found out that there was a trail from where she had been picked up as a hitchhiker, and her card had been used, and that track of where it had been used in the transactions went to Margate. Police officers dug their way down through what was an innocent child's sandpit. Beneath it, they found a thick layer of chalk, and beneath that, a body. But the body they found was not the one they expected. Instead of Dinah McNichol, the remains they'd uncovered were those of Vicky Hamilton. We came here to search for the remains of Dinah McNichol or any physical evidence which might link her disappearance to that house. And that's what we will continue to do. Not long after Vicky Hamilton is discovered, the team unearth other human remains. Another awful discovery at 50 Irvine Drive. A body bag thought to contain the remains of Dinah McNichol brought out from what was the most ordinary of houses. It is no longer. Following the grisly discovery of these two bodies, Tobin is once again sent for trial and is handed down two more life sentences for the murders of 15-year-old Vicky Hamilton and 18-year-old Dinah McNichol. After the, the bodies of Vicky and, and Diana came up in, in Margate, I think that the police were quite confident that more would follow, that, that, that they would find more, more bodies. Operation Anagram narrowed down its investigation into nine unsolved cases of murder and disappearance. Police were especially interested in tracing the owners of jewellery items found at Tobin's houses. The discovery of the jewellery suggests that Tobin had been killing relentlessly over 30 years. But we will never know that 
for certain, unless Tobin himself tells us, and I think that's highly unlikely. There has not been enough evidence yet to press further charges, and the Operation Anagram case file is now closed. Our final story, like our first, involves a killer couple who shared a mutual murderous fixation, bound together by a need to cause pain, destruction and death, this time to little children. He's the extreme end of behaviour. He's a rarity even amongst um, killers. To this day, over half a century later, the case of the Moore's murders still resonates with the British public. Appalled at the horror and cruelty of Hindley and Brady, who killed and tortured five children aged between 10 and 17. The Attorney General warned them that they would have to examine harrowing exhibits and listen to a distressing recording as the case went on. And one such exhibit was shown this afternoon, the hatchet, with which the prosecution alleged that the accused Brady violently assaulted Evans, beating him over the head in the presence of Myra Henley. Brady was very clearly sadistic. He was into sadistic sex um, from, from the beginning. One man who has some insight into the mind of Brady is forensic psychologist Dr Chris Cowie, who has spent many hours in his company assessing Brady's mental health. They had to build a special screens around the dock, uh, glass and, and steel screens, because they were so worried that people would try and attack them. Packed benches, the dock semicircular with a shield of half-inch thick plate glass behind it between the dock and the public gallery. They had to use decoys when they were moving them to and from the courtroom. There's hordes of people outside trying, chanting for their blood. So they were saying it was a trial of the century. It was on, on every, every news programme and on the front cover of every, every newspaper. This trial is certain to make legal history, if only because the Attorney General himself is here leading for the prosecution. The Parliament at the time basically stopped hanging. So when he and Myra Henley went to trial, it was already uh, recognised that he wouldn't be hanged. At the time, I think most people in the country would have quite happily seen him being hanged. When Ian Brady and Myra Hindley came together as partners in crime, they formed what's known psychologically as folie à deux. The two were stronger together than they were separately. <laughs> the thing about folie à deux is that you both share a common delusion. Usually it's a uh, family genetic connection, but the other, the other variation on that is a, is a husband and wife where they share the same delusion. When they come, come together, they almost like egg each other on you know, into a situation you know, which could become quite dangerous and, and homicidal. I don't think they were deluded about what they're doing. I think they clearly, well, he clearly enjoyed it and she became in, involved and engrossed in the whole process. Brady and Hindley built each other up to become more powerful, more predatory, more abusive as a couple than they ever would have been on their own. Saddleworth Moor, nobody could hear these children scream. The desolate moor near Manchester became their killing ground and a burial site for four of their five victims. Brady was in control of this situation. However, without Hindley, there would have been no trust in taking the children off the streets. Sixteen-year-old Pauline Reed was their first victim. Brady planned the execution of her abduction and subsequent murder meticulously but it was Hindley who cold-heartedly manipulated the young girl toward her own grave. Pauline Reed was a bright girl, and she would have been on high alert for a bogeyman, a bogeyman, not a bogey woman. She promised this, this girl some LP records if she would help her look for this glove on the moor. It looks like this, can you help me find it? Of course, 
course, this girl went along quite innocently. But once they got her away from the road, um, they sat on her. And uh, punched her and kicked her, knocked her out, knocked her down. And ultimately, um, she was strangled. Brady and Hindley used the same method to lure their next two victims, John Kilbride and Keith Bennett, off the streets and onto the moors. Hindley was always the innocent bait. Well, the violence of, of the first um, killing, which he didn't find aesthetically pleasing, uh, he wanted to go, he said he wanted to go for a younger victim this time. It would be easier to subdue. He complained afterwards that Pauline Reed was too strong for him. He didn't cope very well with her resistance. So by dropping the age group, he was much more in power and in control. And they kidnapped uh, John Kilbride, who was a 12-year-old boy. He took him off on his own onto the moor and Hindley stayed into the, in the car. There he was strangled and buried and sexually molested. But it was their treatment of their fourth victim, Leslie Ann Downey, that reveals the extent of their cruelty and inhumanity. Brady and Hindley went to the fairground on Boxing Day and they went with the sole intention of finding a victim. And they spotted Leslie Ann Downey, a 10-year-old girl, and she was there on her own. She was taken to their home on the pretext of moving boxes. This, if you like, was a step further. What that meant, awfully, awfully for this little girl, is that they had the luxury of time and they had guaranteed privacy to abuse her. Brady had already got it in his mind that he was going to take photographs of whatever torture he was going to impose. Leslie Ann was undressed, she was gagged, and she was forced to have pornographic photographs taken of her. The whole thing was tape recorded. This was the famous Moore's murder tape that was played in court. What you hear is a little girl who is incredibly distressed, literally pleading for a mother, pleading for mummy and please to go home. Hearing the audio tape in court was devastating for everyone, especially Leslie Ann's mother. Mrs. Beggin, Mrs. said, don't make me get undressed. Please don't make me get undressed, she said. Let me go home to mummy. I'll not, I'll not tell them you've hurt me or harm me, just let me go home to mummy. And the reply was, shut your mouth, else I'll give you a good item. I mean, that wasn't a simple kill by any means. That, that was um, premeditated, systematic, mental and physical abuse of a little girl. It was their wicked, sadistic behaviour that caused such public revulsion and the continued fascination with this evil couple to the present day. Their killing was the first time when a man and a woman had killed together and had killed a number of children that weren't related to them. There was nothing to do with family dynamics. They were killing because they wanted to kill children. Dr Chris Cowie has attempted to diagnose the underlying reason for Brady's actions. He doesn't appear violent, he doesn't appear, he hasn't got a crazed look in his eyes. But that's what is so disconcerting about the man. That, I think, is one of the reasons that makes him so dangerous. He has the ability to manipulate and deceive um, to quite a remarkable degree. Brady also appears to present many of the classic symptoms of the psychopath. Is he psychopathic? I would suspect yes. He showed very little uh, remorse for what he's done. A total lack of compassion for the damage that he's caused to so many people for so long. I mean, interestingly, having, having met him, the one thing that comes across is he's obsessed by Ian Brady. Brady is 74 now and has spent most of his entire life behind bars or in a mental institution. The Moore's murders have defined him in the public eye. There are other killers who fade into the background and everything else, he doesn't fade into the background. But I never saw any remorse. The only time I ever saw any remorse was when he was, was remorse for him, for himself. 